Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's Conversations with Authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, and all of us at FPRI, thank you for joining us live on Zoom and recorded on the FPRI YouTube page. This is a special moment at FPRI. Ten years ago, in January 2013, we gathered in the old FPRI library for an interview program with the temporary name of Firing Line 2.0. The first programs were lunchtime affairs with your host wandering among the audience, mic in hand, asking and taking questions more like Phil Donahue than William F. Buckley Jr., uh, in later years, the program became Geopolitics with Granary, and we transitioned to an evening affairs at the Liberty Museum with host and guest on stage, the host often slouching at an appropriately Buckleyan angle. In 2020, however, we migrated online, moved back to the afternoon, and renamed the program People, Politics, and Prose. At rough count, this program, the first of our second decade and the first of 2023, will be the 96th in the series not counting at least a dozen other special events and series. So whether you have been with us all along or are tuning in for the first time, it's a pleasure to have you with us. The whole world is watching is not, or not yet at least, a phrase associated with this program, but it, it was very much associated with the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, chanted by young people who defied a, quote, police riot, close quote. Over four dramatic days in August, a party riven by internal divisions, shaken by war and assassinations, met to select a presidential nominee, while protesters and police battled in the streets outside. The results changed American politics and echo to the present. In her new book, When the News Broke, Chicago 1968 and the Polarizing of America, Dr. Heather Hendershot presents a narrative and analytical history of a momentous week considering not only the political plots and turgiversations of the period, but also the long-term impact of them, telling a story on the American media landscape and American media understanding. Her book has already received rave reviews, being recommended by The New Yorker just this past week as one of the best books we read this week. So if the whole world was watching, what did they see? How did the experience change both the audience and the networks who provided the coverage? What legacies remain for our politics and our understanding of the media? These questions and yours, which you will enter using the Q&A feature on Zoom, will guide us in our conversation with Dr. Heather Hendershot. Heather Hendershot is Professor of Film and Media Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She holds a BA from Yale and an MA and PhD from the University of Rochester. Winner of a range of awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. Her books include What's Fair on the Air, Cold War, Right-Wing Broadcasting in the Public Interest, and Open to Debate, How William F. Buckley Put Liberal America on the Firing Line, and the reason why I made all those Buckley jokes in my introduction. So thank you for joining us today. Heather Hendershot, we're delighted to have you with us on People, Politics, and Prose. Thank you so much for having me, and I appreciated all those Buckley shout outs at the beginning. <laughs> it's nice. Thank you. Thank you. I, I could not resist. <laughs> so which leads me to my opening question, that is, how does this book about Chicago fit in with your previous work on conservatives, media, and politics? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my earlier early books were on children's television, and I shifted into looking at media and conservative politics. Uh, my first book in that area was on conservative evangelical media. Um, called Shaking the World for Jesus. And it had a historical elements for sure, but a lot of it was very contemporary for that time it was 2004. And a lot of issues around the Christian music industry and different kinds of youth media. And with the next book, What's Fair on the Air, Cold War right-wing broadcasting in the public interest, I wanted to get deeply into policy issues. And in particular, revisit the fairness doctrine, which I think contemporary people not super informed about policy tend to point to as some kind of golden age of, you know, when the government properly regulated the airwaves and it made the airwaves more fair, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was a well-intentioned doctrine that was flawed in many ways, as, as the, the book showed, I think. Um, and a bit player in that book was William F. Buckley Jr., who was a regular guest on a show called Answers for Americans, which was funded by H.L. Hunt, the Texas oil billionaire who funded a ton of right-wing broadcasting in the Cold War years, 50s into the 60s, uh, radio and also some television. 
And Buckley was a regular guest on his show, but he left, uh, uh, he basically figured out that Hunt was kind of a nut. Uh, and what Buckley was doing was forging a new sort of intellectual basis for conservatism and for transforming the Republican Party into something that was much more right wing than it you know, had been in the 50s and 60s and getting away from being the party of Eisenhower and making it into the party of Reagan eventually. Um, and he disagreed with the extremists like Hunt. Uh, he actually agreed with a lot of their politics. He didn't like their style. Their mm -hmm. style was very flamboyant and strange, and he wanted to uh, normalize conservatism. And so that's how I got from that book to the book I did on Firing Line after that. And I was getting away from a focus on religious Meet, I mean, I was dealing with people with serious religious commitments like Buckley, but mm. getting away from a kind of religious studies angle in the work and more towards policy and American uh, media history. And uh, the um, the newest book, um, when the news broke, came from a variety of issues. I mean, one was I wanted to get away from exclusively looking at right wing and conservative politics mm -hmm. and think more about democratic politics. And that was probably in some ways not to psychoanalyze myself too much, but a reaction to the Trump election and thinking, OK, let's think about democratic politics, its history, how that history can help us understand the present. And so um, that's kind of how I got from from there to here. And I could Mm -hmm. Later on in the discussion, tell you some archival stories about you know what the sort of tipping points were for for getting really into the convention, but that's the basic story. Yeah. Well, and there's there's one one delightful irony at the heart of your story in this book, which I think is 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 we, we, I, I'd like to get at right away, and that is that part of what you talk about is is that it is during and as a result of this convention that you get this explosion of people claiming that the press somehow has a liberal bias that mm -hmm. this that essentially the the criticism of the press having liberal bias becomes mainstreamed yeah. um whereas it had existed before but it becomes mainstream um and, and yet you you show two things right one is that you show that uh certainly in the way that most of the networks television networks in particular approached the convention they were so desperate to only show what they could see Mm -hmm. That they were, uh, that if anything, right, they were bending over their backwards to be fair. Yeah. But the, the the bigger irony is that if this this liberal bias was supposed to uh, to serve liberal politics, that actually the show that they end up presenting in 1968 so turns off big chunks of America that they elect Richard Nixon president in November. So if it was if it was a liberal plot, it's it failed spectacularly. It was a spectacularly bad liberal plot if it was, and it and it wasn't right exactly. Right. They were they were very fair and. You know, Humphrey was so hobbled by not just the the coverage, but public perception of the coverage and the mm -hmm. negative reactions to the coverage, to this the coverage that I argue was very fair, that he couldn't tap into convention imagery in his campaign ads, which was like the default, yeah. like that's the first thing you do. You're the nominee and you replay the best parts of your speech and you put them into lots of ads. And he had to really minimalize everything that happened at what should have been his great glory moment of finally being nominated for president. Um, so it's really sad. And then you've got Mayor Daly, whose nickname is Mr. Democrat, right? He's mm -hmm. a team player for the Democrats and he keeps amplifying and what happened in Chicago, because he's fighting back because he's so angry about the coverage and he keeps it in public consciousness. Mm -hmm. so, so Humphrey would like to move on. LBJ is not a uh, super booster for Humphrey <laughs> uh, uh, pub privately and could have told Humphrey, it could have told Daly, stop talking about Chicago. We need mm -hmm. Humphrey to win. But he didn't. He didn't tell Daly yeah. to stop. And so so. Not only did Nixon do a very good job defeating Humphrey, but so did Daly and elliptically, you know, LBJ and sort of not stepping right. in to help. And 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 for uh, for our audience, for audience members who uh, uh, you know, who need to ask their parents about these experiences, I, I like to think there are some of you out there. For many of us, right, we may understand the the stakes in '68 were especially high because Johnson had agreed not had decided not to run in March. The party was uh, uh, divided. There were there were anti-war elements um, who had gathered around uh, Eugene McCarthy, and then of course around Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy is then assassinated in June after winning the, the Democratic uh, primary in California just what a month and a half, two months before the convention. Mm -hmm. And so when the convention gathers, Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, is the favorite candidate because of the way nominees were selected. But it wasn't clear that the party was very happy about it. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, Mayor Daley in Chicago, as you say, is Mr. Democrat, who who partially got the convention because he promised LBJ that he would deliver uh, yeah. a good convention. Um, uh, wants uh, is so desperate to avoid the appearance of any trouble that he clamps down on the press. He makes it difficult for the press to uh, to uh, show much of anything. Um, but the the whole thing turns into this this perfect storm, uh, and. So I want to I want to tease apart two different stories, and then we'll bring them back together at the end, right? So the one story is uh, this is also the rise of television as the the primary medium for showing the mm -hmm. conventions. So there's the story of how the TV networks prepared for this and how they delivered. Um, then there's the issue of uh, Mayor Daley and Chicago and the way they handled the protesters who were, who were going to come. Because as you say, the Republican convention had been in. Miami Beach just a couple of weeks before there had been protests in Miami Beach, but they were not part of the media story. Um, and the whole thing was handled differently. Mm -hmm. So let's, so those two parts, first, let's talk a little bit about TV. So what was the situation going into the convention? Sure. I mean, in 1948, that was the first televised coverage of conventions, but so few Americans had television that it didn't matter that much. And, uh, the networks are still figuring out how to do everything. And I mean, people were smoking, of course, people were smoking for, for years at these conventions, but they hadn't right. figured out like, we need really good ventilation systems because you can't even see people <laughs> from all right. the cigarettes. And they're all reading newspapers. And at one point in 48 people drop, someone drops a newspaper on the floor and it catches on fire from a cigarette, but like, it's just, you know, it's not a managed TV event. By right. 52, enough people have TV that it's, it's pretty serious and and the candidates and the parties are already figuring out we want this to be a kind of stage managed show we would like this to be a promotional event for our party and the parties succeed and fail at that over the years you know in 1964 for example uh lbj does a pretty good job managing his own convention, except that you have this crisis with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Fannie Lou Hamer is making a speech for the Mississippi disenfranchised Blacks, and LBJ interrupts her speech and just gets on TV so that people can't see it because he realizes, I got to spin this media event properly, right? Meanwhile, the Cow Palace in San Francisco Goldwater is, you know, the voice of extremism and people are shouting and screaming, you know, and that con that convention is not really in control. You have a reversal in 68 in a way where Miami is extremely controlled on the air mm -hmm. and you know, sort of on the ground, the convention center and and Chicago has spun out of control as a media event. Right. Uh, and you point to a perfect example of that where there had been some civil unrest riding, if you will, uprising in Miami, and some people were killed, and it was a terrible event, and it was in reaction to the convention, but the news just kind of didn't see it that way. It was a few miles away from the convention center, so they didn't cover it as part of the convention in the way that they covered uh, violence in the streets uh, uh, in Chicago yeah. just shortly thereafter. Random, random historical factoid occurred to me as we were talking, that is four years later in 1972, both parties would be in Miami, wouldn't they? Exactly. Right. And that is a uh, a TV fact in its own way, because <laughs> what the networks wanted every ideally for every convention, they would love every convention to be in the same city. It mm -hmm. is tremendously expensive for them to get all of their staff and their equipment down there. And so when the convention for the Republicans was set up for Miami, uh, the news media were like, please just do the Democratic convention there, too. It would help us so much. And of course, Daly was like, I, I mean, pardon my French, but, you know, screw the media. <laughs> He's glad that they're right. forced to move all their stuff and spend more money and, and you know, more money will come to his town from the convention and so on. They don't want to, you know, he doesn't want to stay in Miami. And also, uh, they're, the governor of Miami is a Republican and there's anxiety that if there's a big violent event, he might actually hold off a little too long on bringing in the National Guard as a way to get back at Democrats as a kind of petty move. So, Miami isn't seen as the safest space by the by the, the party. Yeah. I would say that would have that would have been a total daily move to refuse to call in. The, oh, would it? Yeah, except if, if, see, you, if you had that, the chance. So fascinating, like logically, of course he would. No, yeah, yeah. If he were governor, uh, you know, he could get at the Republicans that way. Yeah, and instead he's got the National Guard there before the convention even starts in Chicago. Right. He's got uh, the five thousand National Guard. 
He's got mm-hmm. 12,000 police officers on 24 hour shifts or 12 hour shifts rotating. And there are about like a thousand uh, Secret Service and FBI people undercover. Some of them are agent provocateur, you know, making trouble in the crowds. And 10,000 protesters came. Hmm. So you've got uh, about 18,000 security people to 10,000 protesters like basically two to one. And so when the violence starts and the the heavily armed people with nightsticks are really taking down the the yippie and hippie protesters. Right. Well, and and that's and that's where we get to that that problem. The the, the phrase police riot which was which was uh, included in the report after the fact that suggested that it was it was the police who began the violence in Chicago, which of course is itself hugely politically uh let's say hugely hugely uh, hugely politically charged statement that well, was taken. It is, right? And what's so fascinating about this government report, popularly called the Walker Report, um, is that if you read the interviews with the people who did the report and look at all the background material and stuff, they actually went into it assuming that Daly was right. They were kind of buying his propaganda line and that the police had been unfairly represented and that it couldn't have been as bad as everyone said. And and uh, they were sort of prepared to come out with a study that showed that that, that the news had been unfair in Chicago and that police had been uh, had gotten a bad rap and so they were like triple fact checking everything mm-hmm. and interviewing i mean hundreds of people it was a huge team to turn out this report fairly quickly and uh everything they triple checked like checked out mm-hmm. so they did mm-hmm. find some instances where protesters had you know thrown a rock at police uh in some cases thrown like plastic bags of urine at the police or you know human excrement like there were actions that the other you know the 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 protesters had done but basically the police riot was in an, an appropriate uh conclusion mm-hmm. but it's amazing that they went into it admittedly later they were like yeah we definitely had some bias and the facts won out over our presumptions going in See, and 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 that also, you know, an, another one of the many ironies of this discussion, right? Because the other one was is that Daly was so determined to keep the press inside the amphitheater yeah. where the events would, uh, where yeah. the where the convention was taking place, and yet the amphitheater was also far enough away from the convention or the conventioners' hotels that when the students began to protest in Grant Park across from what I guess back then was the Conrad Hilton is now the mm-hmm. Chicago Hilton and Towers, mm-hmm. um, when the students were protesting there, that um, you had media and and folks who were staying in the hotel who could get those protests, whereas there wasn't a lot of protest in front of the amphitheater itself. Correct? There was not protest in front of the amphitheater, and the amphitheater was uh, uh, surrounded by guards. It had barbed wire around the top and all the newscasters open by feel, by saying like, we feel like we're in a camp, like a prison mm-hmm. camp and stuck here. Um, so very negative from the get-go, even as they're trying to be fair and so on uh, because it had been so sort of sealed off. Um, and then you, yeah, like you say, miles away, you've got protesters in front of the Hilton and yeah, there's, there's media and politicians staying at the Hilton. So they're there to witness it, but also, that is one of the few places outside the convention hall where Daly allowed the news people to park their trucks. And so their cameras were there and uh, some of those cameras are sort of perched on top of news trucks and they're shooting. But Daly had not resolved an electrical worker strike. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers are on strike. Mm-hmm. And he's got a machine going in Chicago. He's good at resolving strikes. Uh, you know, do the math. Like, why did the strike get resolved? The The outcome of the strike not being resolved was that there were not enough telephones. And for you reference, maybe some younger people watching the show, like before we all carried telephones in our hands, <laughs> we needed wires <laughs> and political conventions demanded the wiring of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra phones because so many people were in town and you had media needed the phones, the uh, delegates needed the phones. Uh, the media needed phones, not just to phone stories and communicate, but the, the phone lines that were installed would be used for live coverage. Mm-hmm. To transmit mm-hmm. through these basically video lines that were. And so without electrical workers to do that, and with someone mysteriously cutting what lines, which was probably electrical workers or, you know, some kind of shenanigans, right? Uh, you couldn't have live coverage outside the convention hall. Hmm. So the the gold standard of news at the time was live coverage. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You know, the fact that like one network caught Lee Harvey Oswald being assassinated, one got it and showed it live, one showed it on film, and then poor ABC had to, you know, didn't have footage. Like liveness was so key to capturing any important historical event or even a minor historic, you know, right. historical event. So they couldn't shoot live outside the amphitheater. And at that moment when protesters are beaten in front of the Conrad Hilton Hotel, they're chanting the whole world is watching. But really, grammatically, it was more like the whole world will be watching in approximately three hours. <laughs> because... After after the film's been developed and after it, it gets right. to an appropriate so, location. Yeah, yeah. If it was video, they still had to motorcycle it back to the convention center. If it was on film, it had to be developed and edited. There was normally that would have been a live event and it ended up being uh, uh, not live because right. of daily. See, and this is where the, the technological aspects of the story are, are are fun, right? To to be reminded of just how big and bulky everything was. The cameras, yeah. the microphones, like even within the convention hall, the yeah. reporters who were on the floor had to wear essentially a headset that made them look like Captain Video um, yeah. while they were while they were trying to speak on, you know, we joke about the size of cell phones 40 years ago, but the the walkie-talkies they were talking in. And and so that's what creates this interesting question of how do you cover an event mm -hmm. that uh, and, and you mentioned this in the book, right? An event where a lot of the stuff can't be covered, right? The caucusing, the, the negotiating. You can cover the votes. You can cover the speeches. Yeah. Um, but the news media were, were gr groping towards figuring out, right? If this is a TV event, how do you make it a TV event? And Yeah. And, and so you yeah. talk about the, yeah, go ahead. The, the, well, the uh, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't cover so much of the behind the scenes stuff. And so, for example, Nixon's uh, Southern strategy works out with Strom Thurmond uh, uh, in Miami. You know, that's not on TV. That's something that print journalists caught on to right. and that shows up in newspapers and magazines later uh, and so on. But, you know, it's not going to get TV coverage. Right. Um, but they since they've been doing this very professionally since 1952, they have a system. And it's mm -hmm. very elaborate. Um, it's a kind of giant machine of hundreds of staff members preparing things. And they have briefing books, like these giant binders that all the uh, floor correspondents and the news anchors read before they get there. And so what's fascinating from a, like an archival history perspective is you read all the briefing books and then you see like, well, what ends up on TV? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have these huge moments of time that they're desperate to, to fill as people disappear off the floor to caucus and it's dead air time. It's, you know, they don't want to be dead air time. And sometimes there's no speech on the dais. There's nothing to cover. And that's when they could have dove into those briefing books. And often they chose not to. Hmm. They couldn't give them viewers more context. And they kind of, because they're speaking to a mass audience and they're assuming, well, some people are very educated and very political and some people are much more casual viewers and some people don't really know politics. They kind of lowered the level of discussion a little bit instead of getting into background stuff. Now that may sound like a really esoteric point and not super important, except when you look at what was in state at stake, like on the first two days, the network's basically conveyed that there were a lot of uh, procedural issues going on, but the mm -hmm. procedural issues were about voting rights and white supremacy, right. because you've got a battle over Georgia uh, and how the delegates were selected. It's very complicated. And then the next day, you've got one about Alabama. And so the networks don't pretend that's not happening. And again, my overall evaluation is they did a great job, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they kind of followed the platform uh, on the dais. The organizers of the convention said, this is procedural stuff. And the networks out of fairness to the, the organization said, well, yeah, I guess this is procedural stuff. And it's about, you know, who's going to vote and where are they going to sit? And, you know, this, and they didn't do the deep dive into the uh, really important racial issues that were happening as well as they could have. They did right. okay with Julian Bond because he was like a great public speaker and he was well, a yeah. handsome. And, looked, you know, that's right. He looked good on TV. So why so, not put him on camera? He looked great on TV. So, so he ended up getting his story told much better than the Alabama story the next day. Right. Well, and you speaking of people who look good on camera, right? The uh, the anchor the anchors uh, who were involved. The the two big networks uh, who were way ahead of everybody else were NBC and CBS. Exactly. And yeah. You talk about the you know, Walter Cronkite for CBS, who uh, the first day basically sits down for however many hours the whole thing went on, and and does and, and apparently to all accounts doesn't move. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that that CBS had a particular uh, way to project 
the news through Walter Cronkite, whereas NBC with Huntley and Brinkley tried to do the kind of tag team sort of setup where if you could get different personalities together. But in both cases, right, they're they're fault they're they're going from a pretty traditional playbook. ABC has to do something different though. Um, yeah. And you you knew I was going to bring this up. So what does yeah. ABC do that's not what CBS and NBC do? Well, let me just, I'll just fill in and say that Cronkite's nickname was Iron Pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sitting there, right? Old Iron right. Pants. Uh, technically, he did get up. There was actually a chemical toilet installed in the anchor booth. So we know that he had human needs. Um, <laughs> but he, he, yeah, he was just sitting there. And, you know, he had famously just been on air for like days, you know, after the Kennedy assassination, just coverage, 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 he would cover space events, you know, NASA and so on, and just be on air constantly, right? Um, and he was the facts guy giving the numbers uh, and so on. And then Huntley and Brinkley had more, as you pointed out, more of a interpersonal dynamic. It was a little more entertaining. Uh, Brinkley was the funny guy and Huntley was more serious. And so they had a kind of routine going. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a comedy show, but you know, there was a, there was, there was a possibility of banter and so on as they delivered their material. And then absolutely ABC is in third place in the ratings. They were the third network created after ABC, uh, CBS and NBC. They're always, they were behind for years and years and especially, especially in news and their news operation was perceived as kind of uh, less classy than yeah. NBC and CBS. Yeah. Right? right. And in Chicago, they uh, pioneered uh, what they called uh, their unconventional convention coverage, which would not be gavel to gavel. So the gold standard was gavel to gavel, you know, opening gavel, you start coverage and you don't stop until the thing ends. Um, and they said, we're going to do something really unique and exciting and different. We're only going to give you a summary for like two hours every night after prime time. So they acted as if this was a brilliant innovation and really they couldn't afford to do gavel to gavel <laughs> coverage. Right. And uh, they didn't want to cancel all their primetime shows. So CBS and NBC see this as very unclassy, right? But they need to do this financially and they keep doing this, right? They do it in 72. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, if I recall correctly, they actually came in first in the ratings in 72 for the convention. Now, not in anything else, but people actually liked the shorter coverage rather than this grueling, grueling hours and hours of coverage. Back in 68, uh, it was the Chicago convention was the most watched mm -hmm. event of the entire year, like the highest right. rates, the most people watching. So ABC had the gimmick of the shorter coverage. But then and I know this is what you're getting to. <laughs> what about William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal? OK, so famously, uh, they hire them to do commentary on mm. each day's events. And, you know, when they went to Buckley and said to him, we would love to have you do, you know, color commentary for the convention, uh, and we want to team you up with someone, uh, he said, well, well, certainly I would be delighted to do that, gentlemen. I can't do his accent. Um, you know, just don't, just don't pair me with, with Gore Vidal. I'll do it with anyone but him. And so they were like, oh, great, let's get Gore Vidal. <laughs> so it's kind of a setup. Right. Uh, obviously, right. And these two are uh, uh, best of enemies was the name of the documentary about this event, right? They were, right. yeah, they were not frenemies, they were enemies. They were downright uh, enemies, right? To the end, as far as actual I'm enemies, right. yes. And uh, in, in 72, Buckley was back doing commentary for ABC, a lesser known fact with John Kenneth Galbraith, who's famous liberal and really was his friend. You know, so they could disagree a lot, have a very good animated discussion, but not come to blows or close to blows. And Gore and, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Gore Vidal and Buckley did almost come to blows um, when um, Vidal called Buckley famously, you know, crypto fascist and uh, Buckley called him a slur and said he was going to sock him in the goddamn nose. And then the uh, moderator was like, whoa, gentlemen. <laughs> you know, uh, or Howard the, K. Smith. Yeah, Howard K. Smith, you know, we don't curse on television and kind of pulled it down a notch. Uh, and you know, that's something that uh, Buckley didn't like to be reminded of over the years. It was a kind of, uh, it, you know, he was very gentlemanly and it was sort of embarrassing for him that he had cursed and threatened to punch someone on tel television, but he could not bear being called a crypto Nazi having yeah. been in World War II and being very patriotic and so on. He he was uh, pushed over the edge by that. And it was a culmination of, a, of you know, fighting, fighting, fighting over, you know, right. several days and and so on. So um, that's that's often understood along with the the whole world is watching scene on Michigan Avenue as like the two takeaways from Chicago 68. And of course, I'm like, here's 
here's 80 more takeaways. 80 more takeaways. That's right. Well, it, the, you know, um, in the in the um, the New American Nation History series, one of the last volumes of the first series was Alan Mattisow's book, The Unraveling of America, which mm. comes out in 1984. And mm. that was a term that Mattisow apparently was inspired to thinking about 1968. This is when it this is when it all starts, the oh, unraveling yeah. of America. And so, yeah, the idea of Buckley and Vidal, who were supposed to be, you know, sort of have a, a drawl off as they both sort of, you know, spoke in their uh, mm -hmm. mid-Atlantic accents about politics, that even they um, uh, almost came to blows is a sign of how tense things had got. Yeah. And yet, um, let's talk about those those other takeaways from 1968. So yes, there's the protests. Yes, there, there's also famously Abraham Ribicoff says, with Eugene McCarthy as president, you will not have Gestapo tactics on the streets of Chicago, mm -hmm. which which leads to one of the other great television moments of 1968. And that is uh, a television camera catching Mayor Daley, perhaps uttering a an expletive towards Abraham Ribicoff. Yes. And the the image that we see most often in uh, print publications, and keep in mind, like there's a ton, there's newspaper coverage, there's magazines, there's so many images coming out of Chicago, right. uh, in addition to what the TV news is doing. And what we see on TV and in a lot of the newspaper uh, and magazine images is like from the side like this, and he's shouting, yeah. right? You can't see his lips. And one of the key technical issues of the convention was Daly was in control of the microphones. So if he hated a delegation, their microphones weren't turned on enough. They would literally at one point, New Hampshire, was it New Hampshire? Wisconsin sent a telegram to the dais through Western <laughs> Union. They In order to get their comment. Uh, yes, registered. because they weren't answering the phone on the dais and Wisconsin was desperate and they sent a telegram to the dais saying, we want our microphone turned on so we can say something, you know, that's how desperate it was. So if Daly says something and the microphone's not turned on, it's not a coincidence. He knows what he's doing. Right. And so uh, he said that uh, he and his friends sitting around him said that he had called uh, Abraham Ribicoff a faker. Yes. Uh, but lip readers found a more salty word have been used and also uh, put possibly some anti-Semitic words as well. Um, so there were lip readers on the other side. And I, I don't think it's happened live, but there were images taken from the other side uh, that that interpreted this differently. Right. Well, and, and 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 famously, one of the young people sitting around Mayor Daley was his son and namesake, Richard M. Daley, who would go on right. to become mayor of Chicago, too, Absolutely. which 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 gets me thinking. And, I, and you know, this is there are so many different things to talk about. But I, I warned you at the beginning that I studied in Chicago and I have a great deal of affection for the city um, mm -hmm. and its complexities mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the role of the of Richard Daley and the image of Richard Daley and his um, his, uh, uh, you know, that he was completely committed to the Democratic Party, but a Democratic Party in 1968 that was, let's say, the, the political center of that party was perhaps in a different place than it is now, mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse. But the, the the question of, you know, who was Richard Daley and, and what was his relationship to what was going on within the party and within the world? Wow. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, yeah, he's a he's a team player, but I've already said, like, he kind of helped Humphrey lose, you know. Right. Uh, he wants Humphrey nominated because LBJ says he wants Humphrey nominated, but he also wants LBJ to be drafted the last minute and come to Chicago. And he's even prepared a giant uh, birthday cake that I just imagine gathering dust <laughs> under the dais, you know, uh, because, because LBJ did not come. It was in the shape of Texas, I think. So, uh, because his, his LBJ's birthday was the second day of the convention. Anita Bryant did the, uh, sang the national anthem and then sang happy, happy birthday to LBJ and these giant plastic candles rose up from the dais. So Daly suspected he stage managed this and he thought, oh, LBJ is going to come at the last minute. At the same time, he really wanted Bobby Kennedy to have mm. been the nominee and he was assassinated yeah. in June. And this, the, that sort of shadow of that assassination hung very, very heavily over the convention. And he, uh, Daly was sort of privately uh, not a lot, not thrilled with LBJ's policy in Vietnam and was not, would have liked to see in Vietnam end. Yeah. And would have liked a, a better war platform, but he was not going to say that publicly. Um, but Bobby Kennedy would have brought that more of a peace platform. And during, uh, not remembering, I think it was the second day, um, uh, there was a, a notion that 
Teddy Kennedy would be drafted and mm -hmm. the idea had been floated before the convention. And that was something that Daly was excited about as well. Is yeah. like get a Kennedy in there, not only because of the political angle, but also because they were Catholics and uh, he was such a strong, committed Catholic. So uh, there's that there's that part of the political story of Daly. There are all the power issues of like the telephone management and so on, keeping people out with um, with peace uh, signs, but letting in anyone with Humphrey signs to come into the convention hall, um, packing the galleries with. Uh, Humphrey supporters, this kind of stuff. I mean, at one point, you can see this in the, the cover of the book that you showed at the beginning of our talk, uh, uh, protesters, pro-peace delegates had smuggled in pro-peace signs. They mm -hmm. printed them overnight on newsprint. Like I like to imagine it was the Chicago Tribune <laughs> and they and somehow they which was pro daily in its coverage of the convention mostly, they printed these pro-peace signs on newspaper overnight, folded it up, hid it in their clothing, and then pulled it out in the middle of the of the convention to show their support. At one point, I actually saw someone holding up a giant queen size bed sheet uh, with a sign for Bobby Kennedy, hand painted, which they must have stolen from a hotel and Probably. spontaneously and you know painted on. Um, and all this stuff was smuggled in, and you had to smuggle it in because Daly wouldn't let you come in with anything that didn't support you know his line. So that's a key part of the daily uh, setup, you know, for to understand about the convention. And the other is just the security. I talked with, you know, the barbed wire things that I've already talked about. He literally tarred over all of the manhole covers so no one could hide under there with weapons. He believed the yippies when they said they would uh, get everyone high on LSD in the water system, which was a complete joke that they could never have pulled off. But he pretended that that could possibly happen. And that was I will say your book is the first place that I discovered that it would take at least five tons of acid in order to, to poison the water supply. Yes, That's a number might, I'd never heard before. That you was might not think very much, but to really genuinely poison the water supply, you need five tons. So it's not really viable uh, for Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin to arrive with five tons of acid in, uh, in Chicago. So, right. Well, and, and it's interesting because related to that, right. Fritz Heinsen has, has written in a question that, that touches on this about the protesters, especially about the yippies because you do talk about how there are tensions between yeah. the yippies and other protest movements oh, absolutely, and yeah. so i want to talk so I'm, I'm curious about that and also about how well you think the press at the time fritz asks how well the press understood the protesters and their motivations and how hard they tried to sort of accurately represent them uh yeah so take either so half of that a two-parter there okay so yeah. first of all um, the tensions between different protesters. Uh, there were definitely uh, members and high profile members of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society in Chicago, but the organization itself decided not to go as an organization out of anxiety about violence, the lack mm -hmm. of permits to march and so on. And also concerns that the, some of the yippies were going there like expecting violence and knowing they, you know, they were going to encourage it. And also let's be clear, there are these agents provocateurs in the crowd, like FBI yeah. agents provoking violence. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot going on. Uh, but, you know, one of internally, some people in the Yippies called Jerry Rubin, uh, I think, bloody Jerry, you know, like he mm -hmm. was the guy gunning for a fight. Right. And he was the, the tough guy. And when Abby Hoffman picked out a pig to nominate for president, Pegasus, uh, uh, Jerry Rubin was like, that pig's too cute. We need an uglier pig because he thought that would be better media imagery. Right. And this little story about Pegasus is relevant because they're always so aware of their media imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Todd Gitlin of SDS has made some critical, critical comments about that. Like we were the policy guys and they were the media guys. Mm -hmm. The media like Cronkite, et cetera, were very aware of that and were very concerned they didn't want to be used by them. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, uh, you know, it it was when they read in a magazine that Hoffman or Rubin said, like, oh, we loved how easy it was to get on the news. All we had to do was some crazy event and they would just show up or, you know, show up at a trial dressed up like Santa Claus or like an American revolutionary and you'll get on TV. Um, so the news people didn't want to be manipulated, but they reckon, but they were also like, but if it's news, we have to cover it. We have to, you know, cover news. And with the it, it, the second part of the question about their attitude towards the protesters, um, they were accused afterwards of bias because they often referred to them, especially towards the end when things got really out of hand, they called them like 
protesters or kids sometimes instead of terrorists or communists. Daly thought they should have been called terrorists or communists. And so by not using that language, kids I think is uh, sympathetic <laughs> and protesters is neutral. Right. And they use both of those, but usually they said protesters. Mm -hmm. um, there uh, was an underplaying of coverage of these protesters, you know, day one, they're like, we just got a report that there was some tear gas and that's it, mm -hmm. you know, and then they go back to covering the convention. Uh, after the convention was over, when there were so many complaints from viewers about unfairness, um, NBC did a content analysis, hours and hours of grueling work of all their coverage and found that, that about 3% of their images were violence in the street. And they estimated that CBS did more like 5%. Um, although the reality is those images were then taken up by local news, they were rebroadcast, they were shown in magazines and newspapers. So in contemporary parlance, we would say they went viral. They right. had bigger presence than they'd had on the initial airing. But the point is that the, the news media did not go out of the way to give lots and lots of coverage to the protesters until it became such a big story that it could not be ignored. Right. And that's, that's literally not until like the third night of the convention. Exactly. Whereas the violence had been going on really for a week. The, and, and, you know, they do some, some really good tear gas coverage the day before that uh, um, uh, with a voiceover of, of Eileen Saarinen, who's one of the few women uh, reporters there. And we never see her. We just hear her voice. And she's literally choking on tear gas as she reports about tear gas. Hmm. Um, it's, it's pretty intense. So, um, um, you know, they do the coverage when they have to cover it. Well, Cronkite said later, we were, it was a no-win situation. This is an interview in like maybe 1971 that's held in Berkeley uh, Library Archive, if anyone wants to dig it up. It's very good. And he says, you know, if we covered too much of the violence, we would be accused of covering too much violence and being too sympathetic. But by not covering it until things got really explosive on that third day, we made it seem like it came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. as opposed to a continuation and an acceleration of what had been happening for a week. So there was, uh, in a way, you know, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. How could they get this right? Right. And and I guess, and that that gets to that issue. We also talk about the the problem of the agent pro provocateur, but just in general, the police were primed. There were some protesters who might have come wanting spectacle um, yeah. and they got it. But of course, you know, some of the worst things that happened that are described elsewhere um, mm -hmm. were never on TV, right? When the yeah. police, the police enforce the curfew in Lincoln Park and they literally mm -hmm. take off their badges and run through the park chasing the kids out. Yeah. Um, that's that's not on TV. That's you know, that that's an image people remember, but there's yeah. no, but there's no a TV of that. Where the TV is all of those 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 harrowing moments on Michigan Avenue. Yeah, although there's also some footage uh, of uh, in Grant Park, which is one of the few events where there a, a permit was allowed. Mm -hmm. and there's this daytime, and they were trying to have a, a festival. Was this the Festival of Life? Well, anyway, they they had this legit event in terms of having a permit, and the police just went into the crowd and started beating them and tear gassing them with with no provocation and we have some images of that that were taken at the time and we also have images that were shown on tv afterwards of 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 protesters i mean just attendees you didn't have to mm -hmm. be a protester you just showed up to see what was going on and they're beneath park benches that have been piled up on top of them they're holding their heads with cloths as the blood drips down so we do have imagery outside of that gotcha. you know some of the worst most remembered events well, and and I I want to talk about uh, about memory and and uh, sort of media reception. So, mm -hmm. um, first of all, for our audience, um, what sources were you able to uncover for understanding public reaction to what the media presented in '68? Well, let me I'll, I'll, let me I'll run through the sources that I used and tell okay. you where audience issues were most crucial. I went to the Paley Center for Media, um, which is a terrific resource in New York City that's only CBS material. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. you can, you know, not only can you see three of the four days of network coverage there, um, but after follow up uh, documentaries on the, the, the presidential election 68. So on just a lot of good solid material. Um, I um, listened to phone conversations between uh, LBJ and Mayor Daley mm -hmm. and LBJ and other players, uh, uh, at the, like his, his uh, attorney general and so on, no. uh, Ramsey Clark. Um, and those are held at the Miller Center. You can get them online. And they're, they're also at the LBJ Library. I went to the University of Illinois, Chicago to look at Daley's papers and Bush's papers which uh, 
are not personal papers. They are extremely impersonal. And you have to go through thousands and thousands of pages to figure out like, where is there something? It's it's a self-censored archive in, mm. a, in a way, mm. you know, like- So Mayor Daly didn't keep a diary and he didn't send right. personal letters to people. There's telling just everybody nothing, you know, you have to really work hard to find incriminating material around the convention and other people have worked in that archive and found great stuff. But, you know, you really have to dig deep for this kind of needle in a haystack stuff. And I found, at one point I found a canceled check that was only in there because of some kind of audit. And it was to pay for the daily film made as a retort to the TV news. And suddenly I found a, to attach to that was a ledger showing the budget for the film. And I saw that they had used DNC money to make the film, like convention money to make the film. And I was like, okay, this is kind of fishy. Like, and, you know, so I, I did myself. And another thing I found was, you know, he had claims about the thousands and thousands of positive letters that he got after the convention. And, you know, he, he got, you know, 1% negative or whatever. Those aren't really strong figures, but the positive letters he had every reason to keep track of those because mailing lists. These were lists of people who, if they were local, you could use for local elections, but you could also give this list to the Democratic National Committee and say, you know, here are thousands of names and addresses of people supportive of me and of what happened. Um, and so you could use it for direct mail and stuff like that. So those kinds of ledgers mean more than they might initially convey. And, you know, I, is it possible he threw out the negative letters and kept the positive ones? Because there aren't many negative letters. It's certainly possible. But that's one place where one gauges uh, mm -hmm. uh, the actual audience response. Um, at the Newberry Library in Chicago, I just looked at journalist papers and did mm -hmm. not write a ton of you know audience stuff and personal stuff. Uh, the Briscoe Center for American History is just a treasure trove. That is at the University of Texas, Austin. And the Ransom Center, uh, and of course the LBJ Presidential Library at Austin, like they get most of the shout outs, you know, mm -hmm. right. they're so heavily used. Um, like Robert Caro <laughs> is always being written up, like he, there he is back in the LBJ Library, but the Briscoe Center for American History, which is about 50 yards away from the LBJ Library, uh, has a wonderful collection of CBS papers and also Walter Cronkite's papers. Uh, uh, the Sokolow papers, who was Cronkite's producer, um, Harry Reasoner's papers, which is a smaller collection. And in the CBS News and the Cronkite papers is where you get tons of viewer mail. See, that's and, what I was curious about is, you know, to whom the, the, to whom do the viewers write and who keeps that yeah. stuff? Yeah, they okay. write to the anchor men. Mm -hmm. primarily uh, they don't they don't say you know send this to the cbs news director they write to mm -hmm. him dear walter cronkite and mm -hmm. so if they're more sympathetic dear walter if they're more formal dear mr cronkite if they're really angry dear idiot <laughs> whatever <laughs> um <laughs> but they're your communist sympathizer dear communist <laughs> sympathizer uh uh and not only are there letters but there are telegrams mm -hmm. And telegrams, uh, again, for people who were born in this century who might be out there, you know, they are emergency missives that mm -hmm. you send because somebody has died or somebody has eloped. Something important has happened that you need to convey. If you are a mother and your child is in Vietnam and a telegram delivery comes to the door, you assume the worst about your, your son in Vietnam, right? So right. this is for emergency use. And the networks, Either the network, you know, either CBS, NBC, or the the anchors were getting telegrams all night after the Battle of Michigan mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way that's more telling about direct response as opposed to letters coming in later in the months that follow, where you sometimes see people responding to the daily campaign or responding to Nixon and kind of reformulating their thinking about what happened a little bit in response to what they're hearing versus people offering a gut reaction the mm -hmm. night that everything happened. And I'll just add, they sent telegrams before the violence was covered to protest things like um, Aretha Franklin singing the national anthem. Right. And, and there's a lot of racial hostility there that she's done a, a kind of a soul version of the national anthem. And this seems like a very dangerous anti-patriotic thing to do. Um, so there's all kinds of your response in the in the Briscoe, uh, not right. just negative stuff about police coverage. See, and, and, you know, unfortunately, right, the, this conversation has been going great. We're, we're running a little short of time, but I wanted okay. to talk about the, the, um, the implications for 
American media and for our understanding of it, right? If, if 1968 is a water, you know, to use whatever terminology you want to use, a watershed, a turning point, um, a, an inflection point, um, what inflected? Um, what do you think, what do you think was different before and after as a result well, of 1968? You referenced this earlier. Uh, one of the through lines of the book is the notion of liberal media bias being mainstreamed and nationalized. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, expand that a little bit, it gives historical nuance the idea of liberal media bias, which a younger person might see as a contemporary issue for debate or discussion, right? But right. this is a tipping point moment for that discourse becoming part of the national conversation. Uh, before Chicago, that was a regional sort of complaint. Like if you were a Southern segregationist, you didn't like the coverage of the civil rights movement. It was because you said that there was liberal bias. Uh, or if you were on the far right, William F. Buckley, certainly farther, you know, people like the KKK, whatever, a range of perspectives on the right or on the left, which, you know, they weren't pleased with mainstream media either, uh, might have thought there was some kind of bias. And of course, on the left, they thought it was a conservative bias. But most people felt that the network news was pretty neutral, objective, and fair. They might have made mistakes. Sometimes they got it wrong. When they got it wrong, they might, you know, a viewer might send a complaint letter. But basically, their brand was objectivity, right. and that attitude, you know, really shifted after. So it's a big inflection point, and it helps us, uh, you know, get some context for these contemporary discussions about media and polarization. And I also think for thinking through issues, well, persistent issues like voting rights and white supremacy are crucial in the book, especially in the first, the earlier chapters. Um, but also now when we discuss, you know, the issue of both sidesism and what that means and, you know, problematic issue of giving coverage to extremists uh, like Richard Spencer and so on, white supremacists, neo-Nazis. Uh, after Chicago, the network did continued the kind of work they had done. They tried to be very fair and objective, but they also started to second guess themselves just a little bit. They were really mm -hmm. worried, like, are we being totally fair? We think so. And I feel like a kind of seed was a seed of self-doubt was planted a little bit. So you had these really well-trained professionals who were suddenly like, hmm, are we being fair? And when the Nixon administration encourages them strongly not to cover the Black Power movement, for example, they stop covering the Black Power movement. They reduce their coverage when uh, and they and they try to go sort of easier on Nixon, even though they still get letters saying, "Why are you being so hard on Nixon?" Well, and I mean, and good source, Nixon. Nixon never never says, "Boy, I'm so glad the press is so nice to me." Exactly right. He is he's completely you know you cannot win right in covering Nixon mm -hmm. unless you completely are fawning in in your coverage right. Um, and in fact, one argument I made in that Buckley book was that if you wanted to learn about Black Power on television. Firing line was a better place to go than the network news. And that was because yeah. the network news was being kind of responsive to the, the Nixon administration, which really weaponized the mm -hmm. idea of, of liberal yeah. media bias. And that idea, like a, it took root. It became something that media think tanks, conservative think tanks, accuracy media groups like that could really weaponize for fundraising. And mm -hmm. it became part of the culture wars. Right. So what's more exciting to debate about? Is it fiscal policy or liberal bias on television? Is it fiscal policy or abortion issues or women's rights issues or gay rights issues? So that the media issues become bound up in other kinds of cultural issues that are very helpful for uh, often for the Republican Party and for fundraising over the next 50 right. years. Well, and, and so we are today, right? Back then we were talking about a, a situation where you had very powerful gatekeepers and there are mm -hmm. you know the best of enemies documentary and and certain other things talk about this period with a sort of wistfulness right back before we had media fragmentation right. but is contemporary media fragmentation can that not be seen as a kind of of uh, of fruitful response to the fear that there were monolithic media elements and isn't it better that there are there's more possibilities well it's there's not an easy answer to that i think right. that we can, uh, Catherine Cater, Kramer Brownell has a book coming out. Uh, the working title now is Cable America. I'm not sure if that'll change, but it's from Princeton University Press. It's about okay. cable. It's really great. And it shows how cable, we need to go back to the Nixon days and not just say it all happened with, with Reagan. But right. Reagan is certainly a, a a tipping point because he deregulates the, the broadcast industry and allows cable to come in. And that eventually re leads to MSNBC and CNN and Fox News and so on. Right. Um, but deregulation leads also to uh, 
HBO making The Wire or a streaming right. series, small niche streaming series like uh, uh, Fleabag or I, I, might, I May Destroy You or a series like Reservation Dogs, which was on network and is now on Hulu. And if you haven't heard of this, that's because there's so much TV. There's too much TV right. to watch. But these are niche shows that feature underrepresented groups, feature, say, Native Americans in starring roles, and they dominate the entire series. And it's their point of view in the, in the show Reservation Dogs. And this kind of niche programming owes its existence to the rise of cable and eventually streaming and the fragmentation of audiences. And so we might say in a shorthand way that scripted entertainment program has radically benefited from mm. The nicheification of audiences and from what Reagan in particular did, right. whereas news media has suffered from fragmentation because these perspectives have become so extreme mm -hmm. and that there would be nothing wrong with having a range of liberal and conservative oriented news programming if they were all committed to telling the truth and then putting a liberal or conservative spin or analysis on it. But if you're getting into a situation of mis and disinformation, then, you know. It, and that, I guess, is is the problem, right? Is, is that uh, if people can find themselves in echo chambers, find themselves, uh, uh, insulate themselves against contrary opinions, yeah. then it's not so great. If there's a lot of opinion and so therefore people can educate themselves in multiple directions, that ain't right. so bad. Yeah. Right, right. Like in other words, to, to use the Reagan language, you know, if we had a genuine free marketplace of ideas where all the ideas were, 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 um, reputable <laughs> and then you can choose among them and, and bounce them off each other and see which what, who was more convincing that would be one thing but once you get into a disinformation kind of market uh, it's not a free market of ideas in the same way well heather hendershot i would love to continue this conversation but uh unfortunately we are just about the end but we hit exactly the point or an important point for for what we do here and that is you know if the idea is to use the fragmentation of the media landscape and the and the possibilities of technology to allow to have lots of different kinds of conversations we're delighted to have you on people politics and prose and the whole reason for having this show whatever we called it um uh, uh over the past 10 years has been to try to find ways to talk about books to talk about ideas and so heather hendershot we thank you for joining us to talk about your terrific book when the news broke is available in bookstores now, correct? Is it, uh, when well, is publication tomorrow. day? Tomorrow. 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 Tomorrow is the release date. Yeah. So there you go. So if you are, if if you're if you're listening to this on on YouTube at, or watching this on YouTube after February 14th, it's available in bookstores now. So thank you very much, Heather Hendershot. Thank FPRI. Thank you. Yes, it, it's been great. And FPRI thanks our sponsors and partners and members for their generous support. Please consider, um, if you enjoyed this conversation, becoming a sponsor, partner, member of FPRI. We'd always love to have you help us to do more of what we do here. Um, today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on, and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. If you have enjoyed our discussion today, tell a friend and bring a friend next time when we gather to discuss and analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, please visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. So until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Here's to 10 more years. <laughs>